Hi there, my name is David Batsoffin and I host a travel blog called Travel and Things. At the moment I'm doing a series called In Conversation With and my guest today is, oh, you may know him for a variety of different things that he's done from carte blanche to I think SAFM and most things in between. It's Angus Big. Angus, how are you doing? How's it, David? Uh, I'm well, thanks. And, and thank you for, for asking me to come and chat. Well, this is exactly what it is. I hope you have a beverage with you that you can enjoy while we talk. Otherwise, it's going to uh, be mine a, is a bit morning. small. I did have one. <laughs> so I may ask you if I need to go and get another one. Fair enough. So, Angus, firstly, where does lockdown find you currently? Um, in Victory Park. In a in two by two apartment. Yes, sorry, uh, <laughs> Adventure Park, Johannesburg. Um, yeah, moved up from Cape Town last year, mm -hmm. and this is where I am right now. I guess pros so, and cons. Pros, yeah. Well, you don't have a mountain and you don't have a sea to look at, but we do have glorious weather in winter here. Yes, you, you know, that, that's, I'm, I'm, whoa, man, it's, I, I don't get sun in this apartment I'm in, and I'm so cold. I am so, I must tell you, I got a Polish jacket at a thrift store in Warsaw in 2003 for 100 Rand. Right. Fabulous. I should go and get it for you. Anyway, it's, I wore that once in Cape Town. Once. In eight years there. Actually, no, when you had those big foamy seas, that, I remember that one um, mm. coming at Sea Point. Things yeah. where the seas almost as high as the promenade. I did wear it there, but now I almost go to sleep in it. <laughs> I wear it all the time and I wear long johns under my jeans. I cannot remember Joburg being this cold. No, man, you're just getting Unless older. It's just me. It? That's, it's yeah, just yeah, me. <laughs> you and my wife, I always joke that in winter my wife sleeps in more clothing than I possess. I have a mound next to me in the bed and somewhere in there <laughs> is her. <laughs> <laughs> Angus, People may hear your name and go, hang on a second, we, I, we seem to remember that name. Take us back through your career. Uh, that's exactly as you get it. Nobody actually knows who I am, but <laughs> a lot of people do say, I know your name from somewhere. And I, well, I'll tell you, the funny thing is, so I was nine years with Carte Blanche producing. Right. I'd moved into TV after <laughs> radio, which was my first passion. Okay. And... I had a travel column on SAFM. I had one on AM Live with John Perman. Uh, it was a four-minute slot on a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And that was fabulous because it was my sort of thing where I could mis mix my current affairs with travel. And I, right. I'd always, my travel in instincts came from the Guardian newspaper and things like that. And just, yeah, I was trying to make things relevant because I've always seen travel and everything is Travel involves everything, as you know, politics, yeah. religion, war, birding, whatever. <laughs> anyway, um, and, and so, yeah, the SFM thing was, was um, a lot of fun doing that with John Perman. That was sort of a, a column, a monologue. Yeah. Um, and I just mixed in some sounds. That was about a four minute. And then on SFM weekend, I used to have an, a five minute. And that was more traditional sort of mini docky thing. Mm. Um, yeah, so, so those, those are sort of like my passions, but it, it wasn't um, a very well, well thought out pursuit in a way because <laughs> I'd, um, it wasn't a way of making a career, earning a living. I mean, look, my, the, the experience, because I mean, they don't, those people don't pay you to go anywhere, as you probably know. I, I would have to do things. Yeah. And in, in those days, you ended up um, bartering and whatever, where, where you're actually doing an amazing marketing and PR job for people. And they, they make you think that they're doing you a favor because they want to give you a free night, yeah. you know, for the chocolate on the pillow. <laughs> um, so I took a bit of offense at that. But um, I, I hear what it, you're it, saying. It and I great yeah, no, it, it gave me a lot of, a, a lot of experience, you know. Mm. Um, and, I, you know, if, if I think before, yeah, the, my, my earliest days on SAFM as a, as a news person was where I actually found travel as a, a pursuit, should we say? Mm -hmm. It was in Somalia, ninety-two, uh, the Black Hawk Down movie, yeah, and and the uh, the Band Aid was Ethiopia, but anyway, that whole region is always getting hit by famine and things and civil mm -hmm. war. But uh, I was mentored by a guy called Mo Amin. 
he ran Viz News Africa, which is basically Reuters Africa. And he, yeah, he'd sort of taken me under my wing. He'd, he'd, he'd met me some way through the Viz News connection that I was part of as a freelance sound man. And he showed me the ropes around East Africa. Um, so I went up to Somalia. Um, I was working for SFM, but they weren't interested in the story. You know, it was a massive story here. It was famine, civil war, and and there was a guy called Malon Otto at the SABC, and he had the bray from Mom's bray, and he said no one's interested in Somalia, and but the whole world was except us. So I took leave, Mm -hmm. and I then went. I, I, I made a deal with a travel company. I think it was called World Travel Holidays or World Leisure, World Leisure something. Anyway. And they flew me to Mombasa. Right. The deal was I would do stuff for Lonro, which I think was one of their clients. Mm-hmm. And Lonro uh, owned Masai Mara Safari Club and Mount Kenya Safari Club. And they wanted me to do some stuff. So obviously, I tried to make out like it was, sure, it was putting me out a bit. But um, <laughs> man, that was fabulous. I mean, East Africa, I'd never been there. And suddenly there I was, boom, landing in Mombasa, then realizing I can't get into Somalia from Mombasa. Then I had to get to Nairobi. And that's where I met Moamin. And then he showed me Wilson Airport, which is where all the aid flights go in. Right. And I, it's like, it's a, that hub for East Africa. You're going to Rwanda, Sudan, all the trouble spots. They, the aid flights go from there. So I flew in with a, me and a Newsweek correspondent guy called Josh Hammer and we we had to lie on these bags of grain in the back of the C-130 and landed in Rwanda and it was yeah I know it was quite interesting and and that's sort of how I found travel because you know the the whole idea seeing the refugees coming out pouring out of Rwanda into what was then Zaire before Mm. it became DRC Um, yeah people with their bundles on their heads because of what was happening um, behind them it was that was radical, and but that, but that was still it was travel for me because the word safari in Swahili means to travel basically as you probably know. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was just this. I thought it was this fascinating world that travel is made of all these different elements. As a, as I was saying to you off before we started recording, you know, war, politics, religion, um, cakes, sunsets, cocktails. It's it's, yeah, it's, all, it's all part of it. You know, you talk about cakes, and I won't mention the hotel, but <laughs> suffice it to say it's in East Africa as well. And it was two of us share a birthday. Two of us that were on that particular junket shared a birthday. So the hotel made us each a cake. Not one for both of us, each of us, a huge cake, which <laughs> tasted awful. <laughs> they were the worst cakes The woman and I had ever, ever eaten. And we looked at each other. We cut slithers for ourselves and then said, you know what? We'd like to share this with the other guests and the staff. And we handed the cakes back. We still laugh about it, but shame. They they tried their best. But, you know, you you mention um, pillows, uh, chocolates on pillows and, and having to do barters. And things haven't changed. And I don't know if you've had this, Angus, where you'll get a call from somebody and go, oh, we'd like you to go and visit our property. It's normally from a PR company. We'd like you to go and visit our property in the Midlands. Um, They're prepared to give you one night. Okay. How do I get there? No, you have to drive. (laughs) Can I claim for petrol? No, they won't pay your petrol. So I've got to drive from Joburg to the Midlands, which is a five-hour drive and two tanks of petrol, and then drive back. All for one night. Yes. Yeah. What part of no do you not understand? <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, no, no. It's, it's the arrogance. And I must be honest, you know, the, the public, the, because the PR companies are getting paid a, a whack, a relative this whack, just to organize us, the people who, who are going to talk about the, their client. Yeah. And I've never I mean, if I was wiser, I should have done that myself years ago, done my own PR company. Yep. and you organize this stuff, you know, and you produce. But somebody just phoning up and saying, will you go and do a story on this? And then they get paid just because they're that proverbial middleman. No, 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 no. 
And then you get there and there's not even a chocolate on the pillow. No, exactly. <laughs> Talking about pillows, I must tell you, East Africa, I, at the Mount Kenya Safari Club, it was one of the most awesome places, even though I hadn't seen a lot at, at that stage yet. Mm. I'd only seen Londolozi and early Londolozi in about 91. But um, I, I stayed in, they put me in this presidential suite. <laughs> and so you had this view of Mount Kenya. The fire was going all day. There was a butler coming in. Um, and the, um, as I, oh yeah, as I remember it, it was on that same pillow had been the heads of old F.W. de Klerk and Haile Selassie. I'll never, I'll never remember those things. They, they both stepped down. I was, Did anyway, you bring the pillow home with was, you? Uh, no, no, I didn't. I, I hadn't learned yet how to filter all those little things that they give you, even though a pillow is not a little thing. No, you but, see, um, I travel with my pillow. Um, I'm uh, very particular about the type of pillow that I sleep on, and I am willing to give up space in my suitcase to take my pillow with me. It's been everywhere from Vietnam to the top of Kilimanjaro with me. Oh, so it has to be a feather pillow. Must no, it's not. It's a, oh. it's a Simmons pillow. I like a very, very hard pillow. I don't like okay. these feathers and doubt. And now you go to certain hotels. I don't know if you've experienced this, where you get what's called a pillow menu, where they give you a menu no. of, of purportedly a variety of different pillows that they can bring to your room and place on your bed. And you should go, well, hey, I tell you, that, that, that makes sense, though, because I hate those, those hard things. And maybe you like them, but you could bounce off them. <laughs> yeah. that, you know, you, these really big things. And I can't sort of like see them. I want my head a bit up, but yeah. I, I don't like the polyester or that, that sort of stuff. Yeah. But those hard things as well are rough. I just like a, a nice, I agree with you, but firm, but mm. feather. I like that. You know, you talk anyway, about that. <laughs> did, did you ever in your youth travel on the old South African railways and they had those horrible horsehair, green leather, in, leather covered pillows? We were talking oh, about wasn't it the round one? Well, actually, wait, That's, I think. Yes. And then yes. If, you, if you were coming up from the Eastern Cape like I was, as you crossed the Vol, you had to toss at least one of them out of the window <laughs> trying to hit a skier or somebody in a boat. Don't ask me why. And I thought I was the only one who did it until I started talking to other people who said, no, it's like a rite of passage. If you're coming across the Vol, you've got to toss one of them out of a window. Now that's before my time, I think. Just before my time. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't know that one. Yeah. I, uh, yeah I, you talk I, I don't have many. Hey? Yeah, you don't have many? No, I, I don't have many um, memories of, the, of train travel bef in South Africa before I did um, something. It went down to... Oh, actually, before I went to the Air Force. <laughs> Sorry. But anyway, yes, that's what they, they took me away. Man, that was a grim experience. <laughs> but anyway. Did, you, did um, you also leave on a train when you went to do national service? Yeah. Oh, yeah. man. Was, let's yeah, let's yeah, not yeah, unpack let's, that one. I've still got photographs. The Eastern yeah, Province, yeah. The, the, the Herald, I think, came to do a story when we left. And I've still got the, the news clipping of a group of us heads out of the window, all looking happy to go to, to do our national service back in 1971. Little did we know what uh, awaited us in Pretoria. <laughs> Little did we know. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. no, no, no. I'd, I'd, I'd already been to Roads vastly, so I, I knew it was coming, so I was ah, okay. very happy. And I'd, I'd okay. been like, I'd been, um, I'd, 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 I'd had my car taken off the road, I'd been, I was not looking forward to it at all. <laughs> but anyway, no, no, the first, Leisure train was, yeah. I, I did something called African Express, I think, to Shamwari as it was opening. Mm. Um, I did that with a girlfriend and it was fabulous. And it stopped wherever it stopped outside Shamwari. I don't know if it, not Colchester, one of those awful little sidings in, in the Eastern Cape. Cape. Yeah. You, you might but know some of that. But the, those, yeah, you those get, early days of train travel, were, were interesting to say the least, because what happened was that you, you ended up sharing a compartment with people. If it was a six sleeper yes. and you were alone, five peop other people would come in and normally at Colesburg, in the early hours of the morning, or Craddock, you'd hear this, Totsin's Tani, Totsin's Wormi, Baya Dangi Verikaya, 
and then doors banging and clattering and crashing as whoever it was climbed onto the train and into your compartment to share the rest of the trip wherever you were going. You've, you've just, yeah, so I've got some residual um, memory you've just triggered. I don't know what it would have, but I, I remember that stuff, different people coming into a compartment. Yeah. And it this, definitely wasn't that national service trip. I mean, no, 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 it, was, it wouldn't have been. It was, I'm, yeah. I, so I, actually, I, I, I must have, um, wherever it had been. I think actually there was one Cape Town trip I'd done uh, by train, a, a mm. bunch of us had done but before I lived in Cape Town. So there was yeah. an interesting anyway. trip that my wife and I, a train trip that my wife and I did in Vietnam. We were going from Hanoi to Sapa, which is way up in the north. And I said to her, are we alone in the compartment that you've booked? And she said, no, we're sharing it. And we walk into the compartment and there's a honeymoon, a Spanish honeymoon couple in the compartment. And they now have to popular. share the compartment with us. And it was very, they spoke very little English. I speak no Spanish at all. Um, and so there was a lot of, of nodding and smiling like the penguins in Madagascar. And then we had to choose how, how we were going to sleep with the guys, go, you know, were they going to sleep down at the bottom? Anyway, we ended up with the, the guy and I sleeping on the top two bunks and the women sleeping below. And I think we screwed up their their night on the train basically oh my goodness didn't you just they went off to somewhere else we were there for four days we get back on the train to go back to hanoi we open the compartment door it's the same couple <laughs> <laughs> they looked at us we looked at them i said to my wife here we go again <laughs> but i'm sure they were happier to see you rather than strangers well this is it we we already knew what what to expect uh, it was an interesting tra train ride just to go back to your time at Carte Blanche, what sort of stuff did you produce? Um, well, you've got to produce what they, they want, you know. Grist to the mill is the investigative stuff. You're right. Um, but I, I, I mean, well, you know, as you know, so my, my penchant was more for um, stories of a conservation bent. That's always mm. how I, I ended up looking at travel then. Um, and so I found some great stories. Um, you know, I would do like squat invasions and house invasions, but um, I did quite a few conservation pieces. Um, and sorry, that's my washing machine in the background. I hope you got I wondered what it was. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's about to take off. My children wanted to try it out, so they're riding inside. <laughs> they are, but the, it's um, like that my mission has just left. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but the, um, no, I, I did an, a number of great conservation and travel stories. Um, Okavango, when it's been declared a World Heritage Site, mm -hmm. so um, uh, a mate of mine was sort of one of the driving forces behind it, Steve Boyes, and they were doing 12 expeditions from the Angolan Highlands down to the Delta. Um, so did one program on that stuff, and that was just phenomenal. Um, and something I'm still involved with, which is always a passion story, was Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique. So I did the first television production on it. And this is, is basically the rehabilitation of a reserve and everything that goes with it. Mm. And, you know, today conservation is, it, community and conservation is the only way you can look at it pretty yeah. much these days. Um, because, yeah, the, the surrounding people have to be taken into account. Otherwise, you're on a failed mission. And the way this place has grown is just phenomenal. They've got ex combatants growing the coffee. Um, you've still got Ronamo camps up there, and they're still mm. having odd clashes and, and um, cars being held up. But uh, the American who, Greg Carr, who basically funded the, 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 the restoration of the place, um, they've still got it going. They've got a lot of women programs on. In fact, I'm doing some stories now because I'm always in touch with them and I've, I've, um, they've, they've got so much going on there that, yeah, I'm, I'm putting that stuff out. Okay. Um, the various types of media. But you, you asked about the types of story on Carl Blanche. I mean, that was your, your question. So, I, yeah. Um, Would it, whatever they bit, want. Bits of go. everything. Bits of current affairs and then, mm. you know, for me, uh, travel. See, visual storytelling is what, it, what, it's, what it's all about. And not everybody always agreed with what uh, the boss wanted to put out. Um, <laughs> but that's just, that's the nature of things, isn't it? 
this, so, is, this is it. But uh, eventually, you've got to pay. You know, you've got to pay the piper, and what what they yeah. want is is the eventual end product, whether it's your kettle of fish or not. Um, so yeah, take, exactly. here's a here's a question out of left field for you. Take me back to Angus Begg in Matric. What did he want to do? What was he like in Matric? Oh, I, um, I, I think most probably like today, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Well, I, <laughs> well, I, I mean, I've, 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 got, I've, I've got the, I'm, I'm doing, I suppose, what, what I want to do, but still finding my way. So what I was, I mean, I, you know, it's just, it's, it was that typically South African thing where you had to go and do either university well, you know, for those of us who are lucky enough to be in this sort of this middle class echelon, mm -hmm. university or or national service, two years. Wow, yeah, no chance to think like yeah. these days, gap year and all that stuff. Um, so I, you know, I mean, matric. Um, I was never a, I was never a really a, a rugby. Then a lot of the guys just grew a lot taller than me. <laughs> and I got a bit irritated, you know. I was in the lightweight form, right? And then, um, and then also rowing. Anyway, just you know, for a thirteen-year-old, it takes your whole bloody weekend. <laughs> you know, yeah, when, what did pan, you know as a thirteen-year-old? Well, you just you knew fun exactly. You wanted to have fun with your mates. I no, loved no. playing park at the park where I grew yeah. up in Parkview, and um, that's what I wanted to do. But this rowing was a whole new discipline, and I just wasn't I wasn't cut out for it. <laughs> and um but, but yeah yeah but you know by, by my trick i just um i had no five-year plan and i still have no five-year plan <laughs> what did you study at varsity uh international relations and law okay. and um with economic history and english and latin because we had to for that for law in those days so why um, did you choose those and, and not something in conservation or did conservation and your love of travel come later? No, I'd, I'd always liked conservation. The first book I'd got, I was about 12, uh, Nick Steele, Game Range on Horseback. It was all about Operation Rhino. But mm -hmm. in those days, or in 1982, there was, there was no opportunity for anything. I think, yeah. I mean, even then it was, a, it was like a thousand rand a month that uh, your rangers were earning. The lodge industry as such didn't, exist no these days a lot of the lodges are taking uh rangers graduates um and people who can they can see add adding value mm. in different fashions man i would have i would have done that today kids are dead lucky today or, yeah you know, what, I'd, what I'd, got said, off it. I'd said to my parents i wanted to be a in those days a game ranger now it would be a field yeah. guide um yeah and and for some reason, my mom spoke to her uncle, who was a, an honorary ranger at Kruger, and he said, no, the only way for David to get anywhere in the industry is to become a vet. Otherwise, he's going to spend his days as a jeep jockey, which is what they were called back then. And as a 17-year-old, that's all I was interested in. I just wanted to drive around in the bush in a vehicle in a uniform. I didn't necessarily yeah. want to be cutting open animals or doing dissections. And so my parents decided that that's not what I was going to do because I couldn't be a vet. I didn't have uh, maths and science in matric. So I yeah. went off and became an electrician because I wasn't necessarily varsity material. Um, and it's only now in my latter years that I'm working for organizations like Eco Training and like Fagaza, where I'm yeah. vicariously being a game ranger. I'm allowed to wear yeah. the epaulets and, I, and the yeah. uniform. <laughs> I've got no qualifications. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm working well, my way brilliant. slowly through, through level one. Oh, brilliant, man. Uh, yeah. The echo training. I mean, I was speaking to your, uh, what's his name? Anton. Anton. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So we, we've been discussing that stuff for years, and I just, I've just said, I, 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 I haven't really had the time. Yeah, the the problem the, now for all, all of those training organizations, of course, is lockdown, as we, as oh, we yes. speak today, being the end of July. Um, yeah. is they can't bring people into those camps because they, you can't social distance there because then you can't bring in the numbers that warrant opening camps and having having staff there for like four people. It's not worth it. Yeah. But on, on that subject of, of the lockdown, you must be pleased that people can at least travel intra-provincially now. 
You, you know the interesting thing, Angus, you, you say that, and I saw this last night, and until it's gazetted, it's not law. So she that wears the duk might still um, uh, change minds and it may revert back. But interesting, I found two large tourist destinations here near Johannesburg. The, and the first one I'd left a voice note for, and I know it had been read because of the two little blue ticks. They never came back to me. The second one, there are five contact phone numbers on their website. Four of the numbers don't no longer work. And the fifth one just rings and rings and rings. Now you'd think that these sort of people, this was yesterday. You'd yeah, think that yeah. these sort of places that have been open for a while, you have been allowed to travel intra-provincially. You just haven't been allowed to sleep over, which you can do now. You'd think yes, these yes. people would be beating, up. when that phone rang, it wouldn't even do one ring and they would have answered it. Oh yeah, I would have thought so. And, and this is where, you know, it's also people that I approached before the lockdown to do stories on, and they go, oh, no, we don't need. Now they're beating a path to my door going, oh, can't you? And I go, no, I don't have the time at the moment. I'm very busy. You know, <laughs> the shoe's on the other foot now. You want to talk, we'll, yeah. we'll chat, but on, on my terms now. Yes. Um, but, but this is the sad thing, is that, and it's a bit of a catch-22. I don't know if you've been speaking to lodge owners of late. Um, I have in Medikwe. And they've been saying to me that the problem is that in order to bring back staff, they've got to have bookings. But in order yeah. for people to book, they've got to know, specifically the international tourists, they've got to know that the lodge will be open when they get there. And Medikwe mm -hmm. at the moment is in total lockdown. You can't get in or out. Um, and it has been for a long while, but the, the problem, so that's the issue. It's a whole catch 22 without guests. You can't get your staff and without staff, you can't get guests and guests and now you, don't want to, to fork out large amounts for deposits either, not knowing if they're going to have to forfeit. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, a place like Madikwe, I mean, all those camps there, yeah. that's, I mean, uh, intra-provincial travel. I mean, what you, that means people from zero to going to nails <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, that they've got no big hub so they they won't be excited at all no not at all i mean we we can get as far as the lion and rhino Park. um yes. and that that's it then because after that it's northwest strictly speaking from johannesburg you can't even go to hadebeesport dam because that's northwest so it yes, means so it it's in, yeah. intra provincial already so you need permits and all that type of stuff. I don't know. But I do know. Go ahead. From the Delta Park group, I was seeing the, uh, what guys have been going to. Um, what's it called? Damn it. There's the name of a place. They've been doing some birding out there. And, well, I mean, they just said there's uh, no, no roadblocks. You'd imagine the worst thing that could happen, you'd imagine is they'd just turn you around if they did and send you home. But, well, well, I um, suppose intra, they, you don't need a permit. It's only once you cross borders. And I've had to do that. Um, I did it last month. And nobody, there was nothing on the, the N4. All the roadblocks yeah. were on the on and off ramps. And you sort of go, well, that's a bit silly, isn't it? Stop the guys on the highway. Uh, not yeah. the guys coming on. I don't know. But anyway, it, it's, it's a whole, I mean, um, I'm going to be interviewing at some particular point, David Marks who uh, wrote uh, Master Jack. And if you remember the opening line from that is, it's a strange, strange world we live in. And that's yes. exactly what it is at the moment because nobody understands what is going on um, or when it will change or, or how it's going to change. You know, I said to you before yeah. we started, we're both currently non-traveling travel writers. And yeah. I don't know about you, but I'm sort of delving back into my archives. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here with a hard drive full of photographs going through this to find blogs, to find images that I haven't used so I can write new, new blog postings every week. Yeah, no, I'm, no, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you on that one. Um, yeah, you know, it's a way it's sort of like going, I mean, in, in, in my sense, I've, I've morphed into the, your bad timing, but the private guiding side as well. Yeah. Because I start using my current affairs history, you know, I was, Therefore, Mandela's release as a lighty, um, you know, all those sort of things. Mm -hmm. State capture, the elections at the Natal Midlands, I covered them there for SAFM. I can bring that all in 
and your top end market likes that stuff. Yeah. But obviously nobody's coming here. Um, <laughs> so they get screwed on that side as as um as well. So yeah, I mean, you've got to start looking at the commercial stuff. Yeah. Um I mean, no, it's 128 you know, days at the moment. It's ridiculous. Yeah, no, it's 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 sort of like ruined me. I just got a, a nice contract actually. Mm. Um a, uh, for the US Foundation that's doing some stuff they nice. asked me to do. And it's related to that um, okay. stuff as well, which, and it's a passion project. So I'm so happy about that because I, I know everything about the, 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 the project. And it's, mm. it's, it's, it's the only positive tourism thing happening in, <laughs> the, in, in tourism in Africa. You know, they're, they're building camps, two more mm. camps. And they've okay. got, yeah, yeah. It's, um, because I see some of the, some of the African countries, I know Tanzania has reopened, uh, Rwanda that I deal with on a relatively regular basis, um, they've opened again to, to leisure travel, which is really nice. And, but it's getting out of South Africa. It's all well and good. They're reopening, That's but they're not a, we can't get out. Yeah. And, and, and certainly yeah, the European countries don't want us because we're still high on the list of, of COVID. Well, again, that's, you know, that's the thing. We, even though, I mean, people are all bleating and there, there's a lot of justified bleating because there's a lot of irrational stuff going on. But I, we, we just got to remember it's, it's hell of a serious what's going yeah. on. Um, the, the main thing, I think it's, it's all, it, you know, for me, and it's a, on quite a spiritual level as well and in touch with, uh, you know, the universe and God. I th this is, as far as I, I'm concerned, it's, it's a it's a culling there are too many of us and it's, it's also like a reckoning of ways and how and, and not everything can be explained by science mm. and this is the best way of dealing with it is that i mean if, if this thing comes from you know if, if the vector for this virus was indeed the pangolin man is that just not poetic justice or what the most threatening <laughs> creature on earth i shouldn't i shouldn't laugh having waited no, 53 years to see a pangolin um, and now he's, it's being accused of causing multiple deaths. They'll go out and slaughter the rest of them to stop this I mean, from spreading. And it, this, the simple thing though, David, is if, we, if, if people can get their heads around the fact that we try and develop the whole planet mm. and there are just people everywhere, things are unsustainable. But it's so easy to see how, because these, as I've, I've done a lot of reading on this stuff, I'm sure you have as well. And it seems that these viruses can live for millions of years, yeah. hundreds of thousands, but they live contained in their own ecosystem. Mm. So you just think about you're going into a forest, you know, the deepest forest, like in the Congo, the loggers go, you're disrupting things completely. You're releasing yeah. stuff. You weren't meant to be there. You're taking out pangolins and whatever else. So you chop down all the trees, bah, bah, bah. immense amounts of hardwood gets sold up to Japan and wherever else, China, and you put up a factory to get, do all the felling, that sort of stuff, put up lights, moths come around, bats come and eat them, you know, yeah. locals want to eat the bats, they're hungry. And in and around there, all with the pangolin at these wet meat markets. So the virus gets passed on. And it's like, it's nature just taking a shot and saying, leave me alone. I'm, I'm convinced. Some, I've got them. As somebody said yeah. to me, this is, this is nature grounding us. Yeah. So you've been naughty and now you must go and sit on the naughty step until I tell you that you that you can come back out. And that's only if you behave yourself. Nanny Jo is looking after all of us. She's never had it better. She's never had a better gig than to look after the entire universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very true. So so who knows, you know, um, everybody, as you say, some people are bleating rightly or wrongly, and everybody wants a date. But you can't, you can't do a date. Um, you know, you can't say September the 1st is going to be the day. Because on um, August the 28th, there may be a huge spike that puts us all back into, into level yeah. five. You know, and I see... It's, it's, it's our behaviors. That's what's happening. It's well, this is it. Just we, like stop, the, we don't want to listen. It's like the UK. I mean, they're now, today, this morning... A bunch of places. I know Leicester's already they're, they're, Manchester, they're down, but Greater Manchester, yeah, Greater Manchester, and they were given three hours three hours notice. 
At yeah. seven o'clock no, no, no. last night, they were told at midnight. So if you were at friends at like, and you only heard the news at five to 12, you were, and you lived 40 minutes away, you were in breach of their new lockdown rules. I watched the but news today for the first time in probably three months, just to see what, I just skipped through all the new ch news channels. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's still COVID. That, that's still the lead story on everything. Yeah. Except today, Boris jo not Boris Johnson, Donald Trump is now trying to tweak the November elections. I think he's trying to, to hang on until the new year. No, but his, old, his own party said, no, he can't do it. Yeah. He needs well, Congress. He's, he's never listened to anybody. He'll institute new laws, Angus. You know the man. Yeah. No, no, yeah, but no, he'll get stuck on that one. If he's his own party in Congress, he's screwed. <laughs> <laughs> and thank goodness they thank goodness the Republicans are now seeing the light and they they, they finally to get through yeah. a, through a glass darkly. Do you have if I go back to pre-lockdown, did did you have a favorite place to go to? Did you have a happy space that if given half oh. a chance, an unlimited budget, you would rock it back there in in a heartbeat? First of all, I'd say the places that are the favorite places I haven't been to. I would have loved to go to Patagonia mm -hmm. and the, the Baltic states, either Estonia and Lithuania, I would have loved to have been around there in Latvia. Okay. Um, the architecture and the culture. Um, and, but, but happy place, you know, around here, you know, I'd, I'd, you, you were speaking about the Midlands right in the beginning. I, you know, since I covered the elections, I've, I haven't been there many times again. Mm -hmm. um, I did do some stuff with the Midlands, Miranda, but Yo, I, I do. I, I really want to get back around there. Mm -hmm. um, so the Midlands is one. The Manjaleti, um, I wrote something for Getaway and I did some stuff for the Daily Maverick. I did news pieces and travel. Um, uh, I love that part. I, 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 the, yeah, the crew, I, I really want to just, uh, I want to get back there. Um, I mean, Madikwe, I haven't been for years. See, I've been in the Cape so long that I've, <laughs> I, I got used to my happy places there. In fact, you know, Gnadendal, yeah, uh, which is near, it's, oh, and the Overberg. I, I designed a beautiful circuit around the Overberg. You know, a bit of mission station. I mean, Gnadendal is just a phenomenal story. Um, right. Sort of twinned with uh, Grayton. Grayton came after Gnadendal. Um, uh, that was, so you know, those two. And then um, down towards Elam at Agullis, um, another great stories there. And Agullis itself, you've got that wild ocean on the one side and five minutes this way, you've got the calm bay of um, Strace Bay. Mm. And that, that's, that's always great. I love that. And, and I, miss, I miss so badly the fame boss. Um, you know, I, I, got, I got really into it because I was living on the slopes of the mountain right. in um, Neville's Peak. And it was still these things you, you do take for granted now. I never did when I was down there. But you just... I, I yeah, it's, it's you just miss being able to walk straight onto that mountain and go mm. for a run or a ride. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, Cape Town, uh, I miss a lot, and the places that I discovered while I was down there, you know, um, up and down west and the and the and the, the southern Cape Coast, you know, the, loads of places, the Overberg, big time. The west coast of South Africa is still underutilized as a tourist destination. You know, there's yeah, so much going on. Agents. Yeah. Well, this is it. But the problem is certain travel, certain property agencies have moved in. Um, I won't yes. name names, but the moment you see one of their signboards up or they've got an office in whatever tiny town it is, yes. you know that you're not going to be able to afford anything in that town any longer. Yes, right. that has happened to places like Paternoster. And, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Azerfontein, all the, the closer villages yeah. that, 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 that did sort of happen. But um, also yeah, it's, it's a beautiful wild coast. You also have to take a translator with you when you go there because they speak. I'm fluent in Afrikaans, but they speak a, a dialect there that you, my ear yeah, does not does not yeah, deal I with well. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, my 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 helper once a week. She was from uh, Mitchell's Plain, or Heidefeld yeah. actually. Made the best curries, Lachmi Reisenberg, and she just uh, she had the, the, all the language. Uh, man, I, I I miss it so much. It was lyrical. Yeah, it's it so indeed. harsh and abrasive up here. <laughs> it is. But their stories are legend along that coast. 
They really yeah. and truly are. Years ago, two of us were going to cycle the length of, of the West Coast. And we tried to get a sponsor on board and nobody would come to the party. Eventually, one bicycle company, local, we approached local manufacturers. And one said, all right, I'll give you each a bicycle. That's it. And at the end of the ride, we're taking the bike back. And we, being the company, will then donate them to, to people of need. Yeah. And, and I looked at, my part, at the guy that I was going to ride with, and I said to him, really, is this what we need? Where they want to get glory off our backs, and we, we decided not to. Then we were going to do it in a tuk-tuk. Until we figured out that a tuk tuk only does a top speed of 25 kilometers an hour, we'd still be driving down that road. We would never have finished. We only had three weeks. We would never and have finished. Legislation, you, I know that was one of my car plant stories, and the tuk tuks, and it was in Cape Town. Yeah. And it was the, the challenge was um, these two guys, Gash and Joburg, mm. who'd started a company. They saw opportunity to brought out a bunch of tuk tuks from India. Um, young guys and the story was on them actually just trying to get these things permission to, yeah. to drive because it's a perfect place you know you've, mm -hmm. you've got your bus each you've got a bus system that works down there but you for your little intra travel yeah um brilliant in the suburbs but they they never actually got it so you guys wouldn't have been allowed to anyway <laughs> it has it on the road it is at 25 kilometers an hour on a highway where you can do 120 we would definitely exactly. have been a hazard um they had them <laughs> in Joburg. i don't know if we still have them here but hey yes. who knows so what next for you angus aside from from this um this project is do you have a website are there places that people oh, can I do. Go yeah. to, to look, um, look it's, it's up angus if they've got work that that may that may serve you oh man yeah um yeah, angusbeg.com. It's B-E-double-G. Yeah. And that's that's my website. And on LinkedIn, I keep most of my, my latest stuff as well. But yeah, yeah, yeah my, my photography, I've got, a, I've got photography pages. They're all visible through mm -hmm. angusbeg.com. And my cool. television work and the writing. Um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much good. where I am. And I'm, I'm looking for all sorts of assignments. Because you've got to, I've got, I've got the, the typical needs that everybody's got, but yep. I haven't had a salary in the longest, longest time, as yep. as I'm sure you all know. But, so we all um, have to. Got a, this is when you know you want to be married because <laughs> you need somebody to help you. <laughs> not just the warmth, not just the warmth at night. <laughs> My guest today has been in uh, that I've been in conversation with has been Angus Big. Angus, thanks very much for joining me here. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you, and I wish you all the very best. And if people want to find Angus's work, remember www.angusbeg with two g's.co.za. Great stuff, Angus. Thanks very much. Cheers for now. Thanks, David. Good one.